Peter had declared Jesus to be the Christ, but when Jesus continues to tell him what the Christ came here to do, to suffer, to be rejected, to die and be resurrected, Peter and the rest of the disciples, they were not having it. In fact, Peter pulls him aside and begins to rebuke him. And it begins to say, you know, this is not going to happen to you. You're going to succeed. You don't have to worry about that. A dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. But Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter. And he tells him basically, fall back in line. You're following me. You know, he declared him to be the Christ. And now he's trying to tell him how to run his kingdom. And that's just not right. And so Jesus continues to say, not only am I going to suffer and die on the cross, but if anyone wants to follow after me, they're going to have to die in this life, and they're going to have to carry up the cross in this life. They were confident in who he was, but they were not confident in his mission. And so he gives them about six days to kind of let all this sink in before he takes three of them up on top of a mountain to help them see a little bit more clearly. So we're in Mark chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 1. And he said to them, And surely I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. So let's just go through some of the amazing events that happened on top of this mountain. It says Jesus was transfigured. That there was a transformation, that there was a metamorphosis. That for 30 plus years, Jesus looked like every other man. But on this day, on top of this mountain, you saw the glory of the Father in the face of the Son. It was incredible. In fact, later on, Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says that we saw the majesty of our King. We saw the glory of God in Jesus. So every word that we have told you is confirmed. Then we also see Moses and Elijah, and they're talking with Jesus. It makes me wonder a couple things. Number one, it makes me wonder why these two men. Why not David or Isaiah? You know, I think at the very least, Moses and Elijah are the embodiment of the law and the prophets. But their lives also paralleled the life of Jesus. And they, they understood a few things that Jesus was about to go through. And secondly, I also wonder, what were they talking about? You know, if I could be a fly on the wall, I'd want to be one there. Uh, I'd like to hear that, that discussion with you. Well, Luke tells us that they were actually talking about Jesus' departure and what he was going to accomplish at Jerusalem. So the very thing that Jesus had been telling his apostles about, and they rejected, is the very thing that him and Moses and Elijah were talking about. You know, even though the apostles couldn't understand it, Moses and Elijah, they were not disturbed by a suffering servant. You know, they, they grasped the idea of a cross before the crown. Peter's so moved by all this, he has no idea what to say, but he just, the first thing that comes out is, let's build three tabernacles, one for each one of you. It's kind of hard to know exactly what Peter's thinking when he says that. At the very least, he's putting them all on the same level. But God, in the middle of Peter's talk, interrupts him and, and he interjects and he says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. I think God is trying to tell the apostles, Hey, listen, uh, Moses and Elijah, they're great servants. and They were wonderful servants. But he's my son. It is him I find pleasure, and it is him that you need to listen to. In Hebrews chapter 1 says that um, there's in various times God has spoken, times past. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. So don't get so wrapped up in Moses and Elijah being there, and you fail to listen to Jesus. If Jesus says he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, that's exactly what he's going to do, Peter. And so Peter goes from making this suggestion, along with James and John, to being prostrate before God with a face to the ground. And Jesus does what he does so often throughout the book of Mark. He, he goes over and he comforts them. He says, do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw nobody but Jesus and themselves. But isn't that true when it comes to us as well? We have this chaotic mess of a religious world all around us. And the only way we know that we can see clearly is when we look up and the only thing that we see is Jesus. That when we drowned out the rest of the noise and we just hear him,